Good morning. Uh, it's time we are about to start. And um, um, thank you for all of you for coming and making time on a Saturday. And um, um, here's our director for the uh, uh, Williamson County Library. And she does a wonderful job. And uh, we are glad to have her. And she's going to introduce our mayor, um, who also made time and um, here to honor us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming out on this beautiful Saturday to celebrate poetry in Williamson County. My name is Dolores Greenwald, and I'm the director here at Williamson County Public Library. And I would like to thank the um, Poets from the Neighborhood from put, for putting this together today. And you've got a packed agenda, so I will, uh, I'll be quick in my statements. I would like to um, mention that if you get the opportunity before you leave, notice some of the uh, capital projects that we've been working on. We've gotten some new carpet. We have a, our computer lab is now going to be a learning center. We've updated it. We haven't had a ribbon cutting on that yet because we're still kind of putting everything together. But we've had the opportunity to have several projects this year that I'm very thankful to the county commissioners and um, to Rogers. I often, I often tell people when it comes to quality of life issues and library issues that uh, Mayor Anderson gets it. He understands and appreciate his support. And we have a lot of different activities going on. We have um, a adult gardening series. We're starting an Alzheimer's lunch and learn series beginning uh, next week. So if you'd like to find out what's going on at the library, all you have to do, send an email to ref at williamson-tn.org and your news comes in every week in your email. Easiest way to do it. And briefly talking before we got started today, uh, Mayor Anderson mentioned one of his poems, one of his favorite poems, which it, it sparked one in my mind too that I would uh, quickly like to share. It is a very famous poem by Runard Kipling. And it's called, If. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting you, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knives to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools, if you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start over again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose your common touch, if neither foes nor living friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute 
which 60 seconds worth of distance run. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it, and which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Thank you, Delores. And um, uh, let's welcome our mayor. Uh, thank you. And I'm a little taller than Delores. <laughs> so thank you uh, for allowing me to come and say a few words today. <clears throat> I was sitting and, and talking to our, uh, to several people before that, that I have a favorite poem, but before I read that poem, I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, my commitment to the, the, the arts. Uh, I grew up in a very rural, uh, agricultural environment by a mom that there wasn't a lot of democracy at my house. Uh, I'm sure you all had the same mom as I did, that if she said do it, you did it because you knew you had to face your dad if you didn't. And mom is not an educated woman. Uh, my mom and dad, my dad worked shift work his entire work life. And mom was a stay-at-home mom for many years until the kids got up and then she went and worked at the cafeteria, not in the library. But mom knew the importance of public education and she understood the value of continuing your education. She made it very simple for us kids that when you finish the 12th grade, you just go to the 13th grade, and the 14th grade, and the 15th grade. She didn't want to complicate it. And she also believed that all of her children were going to be involved in arts in some way. You could pick it. And so back in those days, when I was a young boy, in order to do anything at school, almost anything, particularly sports, you had to have your mom to sign off on a permission slip. And I love baseball, and I love football, and I loved all the sports that most boys uh, could do because they got me out of the tobacco fields and the hay fields and, and hoeing corn. And so I signed, she signed a permission, but I also signed an agreement with her that I would continue in the arts in some way. And so I chose music, but every night my mother, as long as I could can remember, read to us, oftentimes the Bible, but she read to us um, as, as early as I can ever remember, and she couldn't carry a tune in a bushel basket, if you know what that means, an old country term. But on her lap, she would sing to us kids, and Dad would just sit over there and just kind of nod um, that he was so proud of his family. So I say that, that I know all of you are involved in poems or in the arts, and this community continues to grow. We have 225,000 people in Williamson County now. It's growing at about 45% growth every 10 years. You can see that in our schools. I've been around a long time in politics and in the private sector, and I've watched this community grow and develop, and it is, and it does, and it will continue to provide those quality of life issues. I was interrupted a, a brief time in my uh, life after I finished high school, before I went to college. Um, I went to the University of Tennessee, but I spent four years in the military, and I know that Judy is gonna do something later today for our veterans, and veterans are a very special people in my heart because I served in Vietnam, I served in Africa, uh, against some real tyrant people. So it's always great to have a community like this. So I'd like to read this poem. It's called The Dash. Many times I'm called on to go and do funerals. I do not mean to bring this, this uh, down by reading this, but it, it's a very important poem. And if you've ever heard Diane Ellis, um, heard of Diane Ellis, then you might have heard of this poem. And it's called The Dash, and it goes like this. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates of his tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that the first came the dates of the birth and spoke of the following date with tears, but said what matters most 
was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that one is spent alive on this earth and how only those who loved know what little fine is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the clothes, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time you have left. You could be a mid-dash range. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and always try to understand the way others feel and be blessed and be less quick to anger and show appreciation more and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash may only last for a while. So you, when your eulogy is read, when your life actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say of how you spent your dash? Thank you very much. Thank you, Amelia, for uh, reading the wonderful poem. And that's dash is what we are trying to um, you know, make it better today. Um, and uh, I have a favor to ask you. We have some um, certificates of excellence uh, recognizing um, people who have contributed and supported poets from the neighborhood. And uh, all of you here probably have watched us on the TV and um, or heard about us, that's why you're here. So I won't go into that and we are kind of in a time crunch. So we have a program that comes on every Friday on WCTV and they are such wonderful people and we have the local poets um, um, give, provide their work and uh, we um, are honored to bring their voices also there and uh, the WCTV um, team uh, and the new director and uh, program coordinator and all of the um, uh, interns, they are wonderful. So here we have a, a certificates uh, for several people and I think if I can I would give um, appreciation certificates for every one of you. Anyway, thank you. So this is presented to uh, WCTV <coughs> excuse me, for outstanding team support of the Tennessee Poets. So would one of you come up and receive this? Thank you. Turn around. This is our um, a certificate that has been signed um, by the uh, neighborhood F uh, PPTN, and it is for the second annual Tennessee Poets Day to Mr. Bill Brown. For the the keynote, speech. the keynote poetry, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think she wants a picture. <laughs> So the next certificate is being presented to Mr. Jeff Harden, who is, uh, will be doing our poetry craft talk. Mr. Harden. Thank you. Thank you. 
was not clear, but um, she felt that since we asked, the wedding was postponed. Okay. Was it last year? It was not here, but it was on trial. So uh, this certificate, although the that Nancy Fletcher Bloom is not here, she really made a difference last year in the inaugural year of it. And uh, on behalf of her, I'll give it, uh, I'll, I'll let you stand up here and talk about her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Nancy um, Fletcher Blum uh, helped us a lot and uh, in our first inaugural uh, Poets Day last year. Uh, she's um, not here today. Um, she's uh, kind of need your prayers. She's uh, sick. Uh, so um, she deserves a lot of our prayers and love. And thank you. So I think we are ready to start the open mic uh, poetry. Um, uh, it has to be your own uh, work and has to be uh, clean language, no profanity, please. And uh, you'll get five minutes um, worth of uh, reading. Good morning. Um, we have two timekeepers who are going to tell you when you have gone over five minutes. Um, do we have more? Okay. And you know that you have to be good. You can't have anything that isn't family friendly. And we're looking forward to hearing your poems, uh, if you're professional or if you're just writing for fun. It's, it's really great. So the first person we're going to have reading this morning is Judy Dorman, Gorman King. And is it five minutes or just one poem? I'm going to do actually two poems. The first one is short, and so I should fit into five minutes fine. But I have two soft spots. I have it for children and for veterans, especially Vietnam veterans, so I'm going to do both. The first one is just a child. A child is alone. Do we care? A child is hungry. Do we stare? I mean, do we share? A child is different. Do we stare? What difference could I be? After all, they're not like me. A teenager's confused. Do we teach wrong from right? A teenager's on drugs. Do we join the fight? A teenager's killed. Do we look to see if he's black or white? What difference could I be? After all, they're not like me. A child is lost. Do we show them the way? A child is abused. Do we look the other way? A child is hurting. Do we pray? What difference could I be? After all, they're not like me. But he looked down and said to me, what a difference you could be. Why do you look at the color of a face? You're all members of the human race. And do you know what's true? In my eyes, they're just like you. The second one is called the spirit of the wall. And I can't look at anybody when I do it because I get emotional if I do, so I'm gonna look away. You came to see my name today. I saw you standing there. Man, you sure look different with that silver in your hair. But me, I haven't changed. I'm still the ripe old age of 21. That's one of the things about us ghosts. We're now and forever young. Do you remember how proud we were when we were called by Uncle Sam? And I remember being a little afraid when they shipped us to Vietnam. And I remember the heat, the marching through the mud, the sounds of all that shooting and the sight of all that blood. And I remember when it was time for us to go home. I could not go, so you made that trip alone. You returned to a country that couldn't seem to understand how all the boys that left came back messed up men. Our country was a little naive before that mixed up war, and now we never can seem to get things back the way they were before. Now, some of us are just a name just a small part of history, 
but with the building of that wall, somehow it restored our dignity. I saw that there is still pain even after all these years, and I'm afraid I saw a lot of bitterness in your tears. But this is a wall of love, and we hope that's what everyone feels, the warm spirits of all the ones that surround the wall that heals. I saw you had a family, a couple kids, and a pretty wife. Try to forgive the past and have a happy life. Well, I guess I'll go now that I seem to have said it all, but think of me once in a while, the ghost that stays with the wall. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, am I correct that you get to go once every year to talk, to read that poem to the vets? I think they say seven times now. Yeah, and, and, and it's, well, what is the, the occasion that you? Veterans Day, um, Rolling Thunder, and uh, Memorial. Okay. Judy's poem has made a really real difference in how they do the, the events because they expect her to come and they, they dearly love her. And I wanted you all to know that. I also want to tell you that our two timekeepers, Carolyn Moore and David Harris, each have books to sell. And several of the, everybody sitting around the edge is selling books. And next, we are going to have Jennifer Shaw. Good morning. My first poem is entitled Immortalized in Stone. In the past years, we have lost so many, yet their memories will remain strong. They left the world too soon, but for us, they will never be gone. They came in the form of writers and singers, speakers, actors, and actresses. Their wings were not always shown, yet talent flowed through their veins like blood. Now they're immortalized in stone. We all gasped with each loss, yet so many times they stood alone, no one to share their deepest thoughts because they couldn't find anyone that strong. Each one had an amazing journey. Each talent shared a different tone. For years, we looked at them in awe, astonished. Now they are immortalized in stone. God sends angels to earth in many forms. He gives them to us as a loan. We must appreciate the time we share with them until he calls them back to their heavenly home. No words can replace their memories. Each one's remembered for their unique heart song. It seems like we are losing family members as each one becomes immortalized in stone. They cannot be imitated. Filling their shoes cannot be done. They were legends in their own time, from unknown dreamers to number one. Their contributions will live on forever. No one can recreate the words of their unique song. Yet we are thankful for the experiences we shared through their music. Now we fight back tears as they become immortalized in stone. Embodied by their prestigious gifts, saddened because they are no longer shown. Though we search our minds for understanding we know their lives could not be prolonged. We will never forget the, do the donations to this world. To us, they were given all along. Tears fell in silence from our broken hearts as we witnessed them being immortalized in stone. Floored by the thought of being too close, wanting more, yet dreams sometimes go wrong. But today, once again, the world will pause because another legendary genius has gone. They came from all walks of life, sharing their stories through words and song. We will continue to look for a distance in amazement 
as they will remain forever immortalized in stone. And the second one is entitled, Where's Spring? Each morning I wake up, I get out of my bed to look out my window is the first place I head. The breeze is crisp and cold, even when the sunshine is in sight. But as the sun goes down, the weather changes each night. I see the birds flying through the air, a fruit buds on some trees and things. But each time I have to grab a coat, my first thought is where is spring? This is usually, this is usually a time You know what? That's all. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful poem on memories and then the poem on living life as it is today. I, I really think that your poetry is beautiful. Thank you. And next we have Catherine Adams. this beautiful spring day. I just wanted to share something that helps me every time I read it. <laughs> Wake up. It's a brand new morning. Wake up. It's a brand new day. So put hope in your heart and forget yesterday. Even if there's clouds, even if it's dark, even in a flood, God can send the ark. Look up. Don't be discouraged. Don't let the tears get in your eyes. Don't let worries cloud your mind. Leave them all behind. Look ahead to the future. Let love light your way. Let God renew your mind. Tomorrow is a brighter day. Look up. Don't you worry. Keep a song in your heart. Even if you're weary, don't ever give up. Look up and see the sunrise. Don't let burdens cloud your mind. Cast them on your Savior. Leave them all behind. Look ahead to the future. Ask God to heal your soul. Then you'll feel such joy you thought you'd never know. So be of good cheer. God is always near. Look up to him and never fear. Look up. Don't you worry. Keep a song in your heart. Even if you're weary, don't ever give up. God is all-knowing. He has a plan for you. With him by your side, there's nothing you can't do. So look up and see to the future and see a brighter day. God will be beside you all the way. And I'd like to sing an, uh, say another poem that I have. Um, I want to sing on the top of a mountain, fly away on the wings of a song, or snuggle up by the fire at night. It's right where I belong, right where we belong. Lie in a meadow of flowers together in a soft rain shower. As you put a bloom behind my ear, it's perfect just to have you near. Wherever I am, whatever I do, I hope you know it's true. Wherever I am, whatever I do, the perfect day is being with you. Let's have a picnic by the lake. Feed the ducks and take a dip. Catch a fish, cook it on the grill. I'd plant some kisses on your lips. Let's sit on the front porch swing, say hello to the man in the moon. See the Milky Way and count the stars while resting in your arms. It doesn't matter what we do, as long as my arms are always wrapped around you. Wake up and watch the sunrise. Put our toes in the soft, warm sand, far away on a tropical island. Watch the sunset holding your hand. 
lie in a meadow of flowers together in a soft rain shower. As you put a bloom behind my ear, it's perfect just to have you near. Wherever I am, whatever I do, I hope you know it's true. Wherever I am, whatever I do, the perfect day is being with you. Thank you. Okay, that was really two lovely poems on how to live today, how to enjoy every day, and particularly springtime, which is you just automatically feel good in springtime. So thank you, Catherine. Um, next, we have Bruce Jennings, who is a popular poet around here, and I'm glad you're here, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. Recently, I had the privilege of reading some of Vera's new poems uh, about mothers and motherhood, and that inspired me to pull together three poems, short poems, that I'd like to share with you today about growing up and growing old, about going away, and about coming back. First one is called Indiana Mother. As you grew old, I saw you once or twice a year, a guest in my home, a host in yours. With aging eyes, I saw you refuse to lose the rhythm of living close. Remembered feeling embroidered slowly, conversation begun while passing in the hall, other things in mind, continued over dinner the next day, finished late at the kitchen table, Last cup of coffee for the night, wife and son asleep. I chose a living far away, without the slightest, without any idea, honest to God, no idea of what I was giving up, and now you're gone, have lost. You knew when you gave me birth the forked way of an Indiana mother, either to keep close an ordinary son past childhood who would pay the price of living in a flat land, or to bear more gift with wanderlust built in, who would kindle only from afar. You knew what I was stealing. You knew and never said, with roads long clo closed and passed behind us, we can speak of this quietly now as the ticking of the grandfather clock in the late afternoon. Next poem is called Coming Back North. You came back north with nothing but cancer and a line of credit, forsaking the South Florida smell, the taste of water you didn't like, seeking a bed near mine. You came back north with no need to speak of debt. We knew what was to be, played out in a zone of life where obligation whispers. You came back north with nothing but x-rays and memories. We exchanged two views, inside out and present to past. No hope and hoping backward. You came north to go back and I had to find my own way home. Third one is called How Mothers See. My mother said she has eyes in the back of her head. She was a watchful woman. At four, I used my stealth to slip into a room, plotting and investigating some mischief. She would call from the kitchen, summon me, or otherwise describe what I was about to do before I did it. Come out of there now. Put that down. Don't you stick your hand in the fishbowl. Thus began my lifelong fascination with epistemology. But at the time, I had other fish to fry and joined my mother also frying fish in the kitchen. A four-year-old is literal and trusting, a dangerous combination then as now. I could not explain how she saw what I was about to do in another room, line of sight and all that. 
To give the lie to her claim, I began a quest to find the eyes in the back of her head. The Holy Grail comes in many forms. She was patient as I must her hair. She wanted me to search, you see, not to take a fib like that for granted. She was a watchful woman. Search I did, the smell and softness of her hair was what I really was after and it lingers most vividly now, eclipsing my frustration at repeated failure to find her extra set of eyes. The neighbor girl, my playmate then, submitted herself to the same inquiry with similar results. The hypothesis remained that women obtained eyes in the back of their heads when they become mothers the one transformation was no more or less astonishing to me than the other, and still is. You can't see them, but they can see you, my mother remarked dryly and breaded another bluegill. For many years thereafter, abeyance set in, and the backward-looking eyes of a, a metaphor of love ceased to watch. At any rate, she stopped using the, them she no longer needed or wanted, for that matter, to see what I was up to in another room. At the last, the eyes in the back of my mother's head returned with a new task. When she came to my home in April to remember, say goodbye, and to die. We sat together looking backward while staring straight ahead with my soothing hand She let me search her hair once more. From her little room, its flowered wallpaper my wife and I had hung, a sunny window with yellow curtains and a breeze, she watched the rest of the house, knew where I was, what I was trying to do before and even better than I did as ever with those eyes in the back of her head. Bruce is reading on a poet from the neighborhood this month. You can hear him again on every Friday in April, reading not only his own poetry, but other, some uh, other people's poetry. Uh, it comes on at 7.45, at 12.45, and 5.45 on WCTV, or anytime on YouTube. So you, if, I, we enjoyed hearing him this morning, but you can hear him again. And also David is on this time. So these two men will be there doing a real bang up job of reading everybody's poetry. Joseph Powell. How's everybody doing? How's everybody doing? All right, good, good. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, wasn't sure I was gonna read this morning, but here we are. Uh, this first piece I'm gonna do, um, since it is Poetry Month, National Poetry Month, um, is a piece that I wrote in honor of my favorite poet, um, Maya Angelou. And this is called A Hymn for Sister Maya. The epitome of eloquence, the embodiment of elegance, queen, Mother Africa descended in all her glorious splendor. Her voice, once silent long ago, now springs forth like the thunder of a thousand rainstorms, and just as nourishing. Or, like the still, small voice of a gentle angel, bearing glad tidings of great joy. Her beauty knows no equal. Her words are like fine silk, smooth to the touch, pleasing to the skin. Or a double-edged sword piercing bone and marrow.
but she can't help but bring forth truth, the truth. It is her gift to us, her calling, her life's blood, her duty as one raised up from the wilderness, not as a reed swayed by the wind, but a prophetess of the highest order. She is that heaven we find in a wildflower, our mirror to nature. But not only that, she is the storefront preacher, the street rapper, the social worker, your favorite teacher. She is mother, daughter, sister, lover, friend, our fielder of dreams and conveyor of nightmares. She is the cry of Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted. She is the song of the Virgin Mary in praise to her God. Her voice, her candle has finally blown out, but the flame that she has ignited will burn on, eternal. For that is what flames do. Am I, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, can I do one more piece? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this next piece is entitled, uh, Failure is a Bruise, Not a Tattoo. Seen on a church marquee this morning, failure is a bruise, not a tattoo. Words I needed to read at just that moment. Sometimes they come at you like that, like a poem you didn't know you had in you, or a long forgotten song that used to inspire you, that now makes you feel just as strong as it did back then. Like the words, I love you, from your lover, or your mother, or your daughter. Those three words that will never get old. Like the words some wise person at a local church came up with, who was inspired, maybe even encouraged, to put on their marquee for people like me who need to know that we are not failures, at least not the failures we commit, that like bruises, they are only temporary. They fade away and then are gone like tears and rain and what remains can be just as beautiful as a brightly inked tattoo. Thank you. We are having some really nice poems this morning. I particularly like that we are remembering our people we love. We are remembering our, our mothers. I like mothers. And we are just uh, t talking about love and, and living the life that's out there today. We're doing great, aren't we? That's great. Okay. Sherry Page. Hi, Louise. Hi. <laughs> you want to read? You know, Come on. I yeah. <laughs> okay. Sure. I love that this is going on. I see so many people here I know, especially with all the, the landmark book selling uh, poetry group that we had. And, you know, it's just such a rich community. I'm really enjoying you all this morning. Um, this is a poem that I wrote, it's called The Smell of Leather. 
I remember this smell of leather. The first day, a dank day, stilled us after a long run. Trees were high and bright as flags waving, faces glistening from the teamed effort of getting to this rise on the hill. Deep breathing, a kind that only happens here. The great hearts beneath us, snorting out their pleasure to be so alive. I remember as turkey buzzards graced the blue above like angel kites, you turning to whisper, God is in this place. And we knew we followed more than foxes. I'm very excited that my first manuscript has just been accepted for publishing, and if, if it were already out, I would have it here today and I would have more to read. But anyway, I share that with you because it's, it's really exciting to me to, to join this fine community of, of authentic heart and minds. So. Wow, congratulations. We have sat and read poetry to each other down at the bookstore, and it's amazing what you hear people read. And, and I agree, there's a lot of people here who have been there, like Carolyn and everyone. So, um, Susie, are you going to read this morning? Looks like we're to you. You want to come up? Hi. Mine are mostly really short. Findings of fact and conclusions of law. Words are not toys. Secrets have consequences. Forgiveness is possible. Wings. In my dreams I can fly, not afraid of falling. I carry those who need rescuing, those saying goodbye. I reassure the frightened ones, bring the lost ones home. Breach. Richard and I used to go driving every weekend exploring roads we had never noticed before, giving ourselves over to the surprises of randomness. But we got lost again and again and again as we surrendered to the fences of estrangement and sought separate caves for sleep. Colorado Romance. The blue lines on the map tell me that in eight hours I could be in Kachara, where Max Caparelli once told me to loosen up with the old smackaroos. I baked a pumpkin pie for him instead. Weather report. As fall turns to winter, we turn away from each other, cold even in the feather bed. Love disappears in small increments. Moment. She comes alone to that secret place where grasses whisper. Thank you. Thank you everyone who read for the open mic. Um, and thanks again for coming and wonderful poems. And um, I just want to um, uh, announce that Mia had to leave, and it was gracious that he was able to come. Uh, but we had a gift for him that uh, we, we were going to present. But um, um, I want to, uh, we will get it to him, but I want to uh, read that poem here. And it's a framed poem. Um, and that's for him. 
and uh, and it's um, written by me. Um, a good morning in God. As sun gleams its rays and dawn reveals the new day, good morning, I want to say, to all have a good day. In God every day, I meant to say. Foremost, I submit to you my day. Help me keep all evil at bay. God, ground me in you, I pray. Your peace in me you display. For your will every day, use me, you may. Good morning, I want to say, to all come across my way. With smile radiating lesser ray, healing hurts and hatreds nay. Have a God's day, I yearn to say. With every brush stroke, a rainbow I want displayed over the deserts and war struck. Removing all pain and dismay. God's peace today and always, I want to say a good morning in God. Thank you. So my hope is it will hang in his office and he will read it every day. And our county will bloom. <laughs> so thank you. I want to let you all know that um, Poets from the Neighborhood, we have um, a weekly uh, program on the TV and we accept uh, poetry submissions. Um, the information is on that poster board, the green one. Um, so send us uh, poetry and uh, also if you are interested in reading and being on the uh, show uh, as hosts, uh, please let me know. Um, we can uh, um, talk about that. And uh, also, I think, uh, is that a Kriti group? And we have a Kriti group uh, every second uh, Saturday of the month at 10.30 and until 12.30 uh, in the li uh, here, right here at the library second floor, Williamson room. So anybody interested, please join us, you're welcome. Um, thank you. And uh, I think we are ready to, um, ready for our keynote poetry that we have been waiting for. Here's uh, Bill Brown. Y'all hear me pretty good? Okay. I'm, I'm sort of loud anyway, so I don't always need a mic. Uh, it's wonderful to hear your poems and then read to you. Uh, it's an honor. Uh, and I love communities of writers, and this is very neat. It doesn't matter whether you're a beginner, whether you write for yourself or your friends, or whether you write to publish. Uh, there's uh, something Jeff once said, uh, there's a light in our words, and it, and it comes and builds the light inside of us. And I may read a poem for him. Uh, 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 I was supposed to read 30. Am I still on that? Or do you want me to do, try to cut it down to 20, 25? Um, I think you have got 45 minutes. OK, so I'll, I'll try to do 30. And OK, we'll see. We'll see. OK. Uh, uh, I have a new book coming out maybe the end of the year. I won't know until I hear from my publisher. And uh, she had two books ahead of me in October, and they've, they've got a new one, so we'll see. Uh, anyway, it's going to be my new and selected, uh, taken from uh, 10 previous uh, collections of poetry. And so I wanted to read some poems from the new and selected that goes back to, my, to the early 80s when I first started publishing poetry. And so it, and uh, so I'm going to be sort of skipping through books and letting you actually hear some poems that, that go back uh, over 30 years. But I'm going to start with the new section. Uh, uh, the book may be called The Carns. And carns are gathering stones, chipping stones, finding stones that might work together stacked 
into something that has shape and beauty. Uh, they tell you never to get them from a creek or a small stream because that's habitat. And so, uh, but anyway, uh, it, it's probably going to deal with that. And Karn's stacking stones might very well be a larger metaphor for stacking words as a poet. And so I'm going to start with a poem called Carnes Below Claudia's Studio at Liberty Mills, Tennessee. They're stacked beside the creek on a tiny gravel road, patience and craft, the art of searching, seeing, chipping, shaping, mostly limestone, each rock millions of years forming, fossilized, story-filled, itself a carn. The hours spent in rugged contemplation, water burble, wind and leaves, the forest sway, a present for those who pass as the earth crumbles in time what human hands have made. I stack words to remember what words alone can't say. The tongue is an eye, a poet wrote, not just a choking muscle fumbling with age. The earth a grave of lost words, stones and children's bones, a carn itself crude and holy. The gift is in the labor, mother taught. Scrapped palms, broken nails, tired backs, the ordered wonder of shape. So that becomes a metaphor for the poems I write in this book, The Carns. Another poem that's fairly new, I found out over the years at 69 years old that quite often hard times teach you more than middle class easy life. And this is a poem growing up in the country like I did called In Praise of Drought. In morning stillness, brown corn crinkles the color of work spots on my father's hands. Morning wren circle the porch for seed, drink from metal pot I leave in the yard like mother did. Drought time, a place in her life she couldn't leave in farm country, a place that scalds a soul, brings memories of grandparents and cousins in the field, casting fists of dust, an omen sweet Jesus won't fix. Six months of labor flushed down the dung hole. Mother woke in the night, remembering porch whispers, a drought child then, hearing language of fell crops, whir of cicadas in late July, not words so much as voice tones, silence between talk. Why ache helps children know family better? How chosen words looks away, reveals self's that don't populate breakfasts or Sunday dinners. Praise be to moments true as dust and scorched earth. Heartbreak, powdered milk, Christmas singing and a stingy Santa Claus. Father and mother, now dust, their spirits heavenward in their faith. Rain in late summer brings hope back, brings men talking trash beside pickups at the grocery. Their hearts tied to soil, surrounding barns, skies ever hopeful, ever endless. What souls learn from hard times, smiles born in love, whispers in loss, parents' dreams of drought tight against me, taught silence, mystery, who we really are, who we must be. This is a poem about a brother. It goes back many years. It was the uh, first poem I ever won a first place award from uh, uh, in Michigan uh, publication. Our Pact. My brother would read my quiet sorrow, follow me to our room, and stand at the door staring while I sulked on the bed, head toward the wall. When I turned, he'd confront me, I'd he'd catch dirty shorts in his face. Lighten up, he'd say. You ain't dead yet. 
I'd perform my leaping tackle and he'd tickle me until I gave up, half silly and drunk with anger. We'd laugh at my teenage grief, how serious I was about football and Becky Lewis. She dumped me once a week. <laughs> at night, he'd fart under the covers and claim it was an earthquake. And the bed shook like a lifeboat in the storm. Camping at Price's Pond, he found a black flint arrowhead which he would rub before calling a host of owls around our fire loud enough to wake the dead. These frames passed through my head like coming attractions at the picture show. This morning as I woke to the pastel light of hospital green, my brother's vital signs blipped across the screen and his lips quivered for the words an aneurysm had stolen from his tongue. I found myself saying, lighten up, you ain't dead yet. You ain't dead yet, saying it over and over until the phrase became our secret pact. As powerful as black arrowheads, magic owl calls and his tight grip on my hand. My grandmother was the storyteller of my family. She uh, grew up part Cherokee. Her great-grandmother sang her mother Cherokee lullabies. And uh, she lived with my, my great-grandfather, who Will comes from, William. And they had a farm, 276 acres, uh, above the Tennessee River uh, on a ridge. And uh, they have been dead a long time, but I still tell her stories over and over because that's how I started writing. This is called On a Park Bench in Heaven. On a park bench in heaven, my grandparents sit staring through all that holiness which glimmers, they think, like freezing rain on winter trees. They were pleased to be here at first, flattered to be taken, despite all their Sunday plowing. The pearly gates are just fine, my grandmother says, but she would trade the lot for a tin of snuff. My grandfather would sell his soul for a pocket watch. He's tired of asking every saint that flies by what time it is. All this gold and silver remind them of the dining room at the Holiday Inn. What they really miss is the smell of honeysuckle or the way woodland violets circle star trillium like a wedding quilt in spring. We've been here 20 years, my grandfather says, and to date, no funerals, no sick friends, no floods, no droughts, no nips of sour mash at the general store on Saturday afternoons, and heart music day and night. Not one angel flat picks or sings a whiskey tenor. In the pickup glove compartment of his heart, he wonders if hell wasn't a little more like Tennessee. Love poem for my wife. We uh, bought a little farmhouse uh, called on Crocker Springs Road, south of Jolton, and I uh, had an orchard and a hill, and uh, I really started publishing there. And uh, anyway, uh, this is a love poem to her. Talking to you asleep. Searching the drawer for matching socks. I watch you sleeping and it dawned on me how much I like cutting tall weeds in the orchard while you mow the grass. The orchard's five rows of shadows move in strange regiment through the day. Listen, we have fought 20 years successfully, sometimes for, sometimes against, oftentimes just for the sake of fighting. And I still smile when you get up in the dark and trip over my hiking boots. When you crawl over me to get on your side of the bed, you pay me back with your sharp knees. We have five degrees, two cats, and an old farmhouse. In this morning quiet, your hair still falls and barmaid tangles against your pillow. The only movement is through the window by your head, wind breaking orchard shadows when leaves dapple them with light. And uh, the last poem of uh, my first long collection, uh, 
was called Night Song for Robert Reeder, who owned the cabin up above uh, Teleco Plains, about 5,000 feet. Uh, and uh, there was no electricity. You heated with wood. And uh, there was a horrible storm that night, and I was alone uh, by myself. Night Song. All night, trees rain leaves against the roof, hickory, maple, oak, palmed and scraped, wood and tin, combed the air like ghost hands, freed from the arms of men who greet with hands. And in the ill logic of half sleep, the side of my brain, which understands my heart, heard the song of the leaves as they tossed across the night. I have lived among these trees for years, we have felt the sky's weight heavy on our seed. We are passengers on this gracious rock which circles a dying star. And I, some nights, take this on faith that the same glue which holds my life in balance allows the earth to fly the moon like a kite and scatters these leaves through this night homeward. Uh, my mother, I was very, very close to her. Uh, she started reading Shakespeare to me and Emily Dickinson when I was a child. Uh, she never went to college, never could, but the depression hit. And uh, anyway, uh, this was her first illness, and we got this. Please come in if you wish. We got this phone call of my wife and I at 2 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> You know, come on, sister. Mounding potatoes. The phone call at 2 a.m. was my sister saying that you had died in the emergency room, but had been shocked to life so that your pulse stabilized, and you told the doctor you remembered the whole event, heart stopping and the sharp electric trip back. He said that such a memory wasn't likely. But you stuck to your story, even during the ambulance ride to the medical center where magical balloons sail their timely voyage through your blood to stretch the vessels which clogged your heart. Mother, today you smile at my concern, knowing what death is like. At 82, you heard no voices from beyond, no angelic music fluttering a heavenly welcome. Your faith was stuck in the strength of this world as the frantic voice commands and the laying on of fire kept you in life's routine. Two weeks later, I marveled to watch your strong hands mound young plants in my garden, dreaming the while of new potatoes with parsley resurrected from this simple ground. This is my poem against technology. Uh, you know, I don't do Facebook, except every once in a while with Jeff. Uh, I don't uh, text. <laughs> I don't twit. <laughs> and, uh, and I can't live without a computer. But thank God, when I was working at Vanderbilt, the, the techie was the office next to mine. This is called worship. This morning, I opened the wood stove and here something escaped the chimney. Maybe the ghost of last May, a month too warm for burning, when we built a roaring fire and left the doors open. There's a spirit in a stove. When I was 20, I scoffed at myths like the hearth god. At 50, I'll practice any ritual born from simple human need. God of morning coffee and Sunday papers. God of lazy lovemaking, wine and old books. God of tilling, planting, and harvesting. I won't recognize the God of television, videos, cellular phones, but the God of tractors, handmade tools, raking leaves and sweeping the porch. Praise be to the God of sheets billowing like sails in the sun and the dank God of storm cellars, spidery and safe. I kneel willingly to the God of stirring soup 
and needing bread, to all gods of needful work. So this morning, after hearing the stove god honk the chimney, I kindle the first fall fire to all the gods of necessity who keep us fed and warm, and to the gods of little pleasures who teach us to be kind. We live in a bad world. I was uh, listening to the war poems uh, that I love so much and uh, to the mayor talk about his four years that interrupted his life. My brother was interrupted. He was a physician who was drafted by the Navy and put on the front lines with the Marines in Vietnam. My time in the Army was only seven years in the National Guard and my active duty was only for hurricanes and tornadoes and I felt very proud to be part of that in my tank unit. Okay, anyway, this happened. Uh, this is a poem called Anne. Friday, home from work, I flip on the war, easy to do, isn't it? And watch a group of Marines help a family bury their dead. And it seems that soldiers call the car to stop with bullhorns, but was the driver deaf? No one knew, so the car was destroyed. And the Shia women wail and wave their hands against losing what they love, against the charred remains, and the Marines stare at their feet, and one young man being interviewed can't look at the camera, and the Imam proclaims them martyrs, says that they are already one with God, and the sand and dirt pitch from the shovels as holes deepen, and the desert sun cannot prevent the holes from filling up with shadows. And the deeper, the darker they become until the bodies are lowered and the wailing and waving of hands continue. And one of the town fathers lets the translator kiss him on the customary cheek. Could the Marines do anything because the car wouldn't stop? No killed an old man and his three children. He didn't speak English. Iraq. I'm 69 years old and I've never lived in time of peace. Born in 1948, my father had just come back from the Pacific. He never would tell me because I was just a little kid that he watched Japanese soldiers drop like lemmings off of cliffs into the ocean. He saw spinning planes dive into human ships full of Navy men. He told my brother, who would tell me later in life after he was dead. Okay, table nine, another grandmother poem, okay? Uh, this is weird. Please remember that this actually happened outside of Jackson, Tennessee, when uh, uh, Cracker Barrel still had a smoking section. Any of y'all remember that? Okay. <laughs> Table nine. Oh, grandmother, while eating breakfast at Cracker Barrel, imagine my surprise to find your antique picture hanging in a grouping with a Coca-Cola sign, a stranger on a tractor, and a mule breaking sod. You taught me how to tight line fish on Cub Creek, to spit on my hands and rub them in sand to take an eel off a hook, to steal eggs beneath the hen, to suck on whorehound to make it last. Which cousin betrayed you? Hacked the portrait at a yard sale, not knowing that you'd end up in a chain restaurant with old timer motif. The last time our eyes met, you were in intensive care at the Madison County Hospital, hooked up to machines, your jaw set against doctors who wouldn't let your heart stop so you could drift to your just reward. Now you hang above table nine in the non-smoking section, honored or condemned, I don't know, to gaze at two eggs over easy with hash browns. Rhonda will be your servant. <laughs> My father died in my arms when I was 16. I never knew if I'd killed him, uh, trying to pump his chest, trying to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, resuscitation that I learned as a Boy Scout. 
Ah, uh, it didn't work. My father was a man full of love for everything. Uh, how does uh, someone write about the father when he dies uh, in your arms for so long? And uh, evidently, I was almost struck dead myself. My father made love. My father made love to failure. The curve of his lips turned down in timid sorrow to men whose promises meant little, whose greed made love to nothing. My father made love to my mother, her shoulders, her feet, her hair. He cherished the air she breathed, the air that trailed her expectations, unreached, unreachable. My father made love to the shower he crooned in, to the hymns he sang, to the grape juice he served as the blood of Jesus, his own blood mortal and sick in love. Oh, but cypress knees, birch bark, arrowheads, igneous rock, tuned motors, the ears of dogs were his lovers. My father was the man who made love to rivers, the buffalo, into the duck, into the Tennessee. He spread his maps on the floor and traced their flow with fingers to read his future. Cut bait, fishing line, sculling paddle, the lugger cats he pulled from the water. He made love to anything. My father made love to campsites, to tents he staked and trenched against the coming rain. When his stars imploded, his mountains folded, his rivers drowned in a desk drawer, my father died watching gun smoke, died loving the carpet I laid him on, the palms I used to pump his chest, the lips I placed over his mouth. His last breath was mine. Two more poems. Well, two short and one other, okay? The Names of Creeks. Uh, I was riding the back way to go uh, trout fishing at the Caney Fort, and I started looking at the Names of Creeks, and I started writing their names down. Uh, and this poem just had to come. Today the rounds of hay sit quietly in their fields. A light frost melts from their tops. Steams the air like loaves of fresh bread on someone's porch. The hills, like the heads of children sleeping, are scruffed with hardwoods. They tangle with huckleberry, like my morning heart, not easy to sort through, pathless and mum. Except whatever comes, a poet said. I want to invert that thought, come to whatever accepts. But the words don't make the right sense exactly. Today, sense nestles in the names of creeks, dry fork, crippled, troublesome, new hope. Jeff read a poem once, and I read the poem once, and in it he says, the light which dwells in our words. And when I read it, I realized that I had been researching of color indigo, which came into English when people from India and others began to trade dye. And so I saw an indigo bunny flash on the road. And I just had to find out more about that word. And just words brought my study to this poem. The light which dwells in my words. One can hear the river in a poem. Feel the tug of forever as the moon glints the shoals the current constant, the light changing interpretation as the planet moves. The light on a bunning's wing becomes the word bunning and will always be that light, half bluebird, half sun god. Indico, from Spanish, from Latin, indicum, from Greek, indicon, Indian dye from indicos. How far can you trace a color in language the same timeless sun bouncing off feathers as they flutter across the road. The word mother, she who first pointed out the bird feeding in river grass, will always be part of that name. Her face visiting dreams you after, you're after she's dead. 
She says the word bunting and indigo will follow and the memory of the one who taught this bird at the edge of a river where the sun still bounces off a roll of shoals where a person might come to reclaim a part of the self in hopes that the light which dwells in words in some way dwells in us. And I will finish with a poem again for my father. Uh, how do you build a father who died when you were 16 and you're 69? It's called the fictive imagination. Okay? All memoirs are full of it. Okay? Because we have to build a world as writers that is believable. And we have to do that using our imagination and our knowledge of it. Anyway, do you know what a pantoon is? Pantoon is a very rigid form of a poem which was once a Malaysian prayer. And this is a pantoon called The Light That Follows Rivers. Like the light that follows rivers in the night, a figure hovers ghost-like in my dreams. My father or stranger, sometimes the same, his blue eyes stain, his thoughts to read. His gruff hands hover luminous in my dreams. Above my childhood slumber, they touch my head. His blue eyes like his hands, I wish to read, yet I am older than my father when he died. Above my childhood slumber, they touch my head. His eyes, his hands, his storied voice, all lullabies. Though I am older than my father when he died, as men we travel alone. I know that now. His eyes, his hands, his storied voice, his lullabies. My father, my stranger, always the same. As men, we travel lonely. I know that now, like the light that follows rivers in my dreams. Thank you so much. We got about a few minutes, five minutes to ten minutes again. One, two questions. For those of us who aren't familiar with the pantoon, could you explain the rules of the form? Oh gosh. <laughs> it's easy to, to just put that on in Google. And you'll get some pantoons or five pages long. Uh, this one I copied from a wonderful African American poet in Atlanta. And, uh, uh, whose name I'm blanking on. I introduced her to the Southern Festival of Books. <laughs> anyway, uh, and it's a short form. It's just four. <coughs> but what you do is you start repeating lines immediately. Like the light that follows rivers in the night, the figure hovers ghost-like in my dreams. My father, my stranger, sometimes the same. His blue eyes stain, his thoughts to read. And then the next three will start putting these in a different type of an arrangement, which you can get on Google. <coughs> His gruff ends hover luminous in my dreams, okay? I repeat the second ending. Above my childhood slumber, they touch my head. Okay, that's gonna align with red, and that's gonna be a new ending. His blue eyes like his hands, I wish to read. That's the last ending of the fourth, of the first stanza. Yet I'm older than my father when he died. That will be a, a new ending as well. So there are only two new endings in the second stanza. Above my childhood slumber, they touch my head, okay? I'm picking up one of the new endings from the second stanza, okay? His blue eyes like his hands, I wish to read. That would be the last of the first stanza again. His blue eyes like his hands, I, I wish to read, okay? Yet I'm older than my father when he died. That's the only uh, 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 new line in the second stanza. And then it continues on that way. And, uh, and, and but you can, you can get it. The main thing is, if it's three pages long, it has to keep changing the endings as the stanzas come. And it's easier to write one that's shorter. Uh, but it, it is a form of prayer, uh, an, an Islamic form of prayer that, that changed into uh, a poem. And it's most 
often thought in America by American poets as a Renaissance form. It is not. It came from Malaysia. One other question. Or is that it? I have one. Yes. Um, okay. Writing that takes a lot of patience and a lot of redoing. Right? I, is it that it's easier to make a point? Is your reason for writing that, that form, does it make you feel uh, good that you have done it? Uh, or why would we you know, some of you were looking at me like, is he praying? It, it is almost prayer-like uh, or hymnal-like in, in its repetition. And, uh, and so, yes, it does make you feel. I was talking uh, to the lady in, in blue back here about her short poems that I really admired when she, when she read them. Uh, and I was telling her so many people who don't write uh, don't understand that it is more difficult to write a short poem than, this, than it is a longer one. I, I find the same thing with this. Oh, okay. That uh, to be able to take that form and to actually bring it, my father, my stranger, you almost have to have opposites being made one in a poem like this. And isn't that what prayer does as well uh, in many, many ways? Uh, uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, if you'll read some of the quotes from uh, the, the Sufi uh, uh, master Rumi, who never wrote a word down. People just followed him around and wrote down everything he said because he spoke in poetry. Uh, you'll, you'll find uh, that his short repetitions, quotes. Well, we have a poet in Georgia who spent his life interpreting them. Coleman Barks, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, so sometimes short poems, getting it right, it's hard to do. But when you can capture the moment, like this lady did, in some of those short poems, uh, it's worth everything that you put into it. Except sometimes it will take you days to find it. And sometimes you can write a prose poem in, in, a, in an hour and feel good about it. Anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Um, Susie, coming from Bill, that's great. <laughs> and, um, yeah, for those, um, um, most of us know Bill. For those who don't, I, he didn't do proper introduction, I guess. <laughs> So, um, just a brief one. He, he's, you know, you can find him, Google him, and uh, poet um, Bill Brown. Uh, he's a National Foundation for Advancement in the Arts Award recipient, fellow at the Virginia Center for Creative Arts, uh, among many others, um, and author of 10 poetry collections. And... Um, uh, everybody, if you, I'm sure after this, you n never forget this poet, right? Yeah, and I'm sure he inspired you. And um, yeah, the very first time I heard him, six or seven years back at MTSU, uh, read his uh, mother poem. Um, that's uh, it. Will touch, you know, like you never forget. So. Uh, we are honored that he was able to come. It just, just asked, and he's no questions. Yeah, sure, you know. So that's a good heart, and we are thankful for all these great poets. Um, uh, so, counting our blessings. Thank you. I stole your pen. By the way. Oh, <laughs> that's uh, probably. So Okay. That's okay. Well, that's, I'm bad about that. I used to leave school after uh, six classes and my pocket would be full of pens. You should write a poem about that. I think many of us, the other day I caught myself at the tax office. Then I said, oh, this must be, you know, then went back and gave it. So we, we, we all have that. So, uh, George, Spain. Yes. Would you like to read? All right. Uh, 
I have three poems I want to read. Uh, it's from my book, new book of poetry, Dreaming the Fire Away. Listen to whippoorwills. Listen to the whippoorwills calling beyond the window as they did last night and the night before in the woods around the house where the great horned owl is hooting. I touched you, but you rolled away. You're back to me. Your heart broken in pieces like white porcelain. I'd be, I had promised you to be true forever. My mother's ring is there to prove it. The one you took from your finger yesterday and placed on the dressing table where it glimmers as a silver thorn in the moonlight. That day when I told you all that was in your eyes has disappeared and not returned. I had promised you five children and I did not fail you, but they can never repair what has been broken. Yes, the whippoorwills are calling to one another in the darkness in the tall trees high above the house and the owl is calling and calling and there is no answer. The devil is a gentleman. The devil is a gentleman on a fine blood horse he sits on an English saddle, of course. His coat is blood red, his waistcoat pure white. His boots are knee high, his spurs shining bright. Handsome he is with his coal black hair and close cut beard and smile so fair. He doffs his top hat to all who he sees to rich and to poor, for he believes one should not look wicked, one should look kind, for his face tires easily, looking wicked all the time. In the old days, his face was so scary it made babies cry, but now people smile up at him as he smiles from on high. He knows he must change to keep up with man, who's changing faster than even God can, or so man believes. He believes he knows all, that God and the devil are both falderall. Now that he's lost faith in the hot fires of hell, man just wants to text and to tweet and to send emails and talk on cell phones and spend more than he's got so now the devil's a banker who lends money from a pot. He leaves hell every morning with gold coins in his purse and rides forth with a smile to see whom he can coerce. With their souls as their collateral for all that he loans, which one day he'll collect on and he'll smile at their groans. For the devil is a gentleman on a fine blood horse. He sits on an English saddle, of course. His smile draws man to him, his smile so fair. Handsome he is with his coal black hair. This third one was uh, published in 1969 in Russia. Uh, it was one of the first things I ever wrote. I'd written some other poetry, though I write primarily historical fiction now. Uh, and I'd sent several to the Atlantic Monthly and two or three other magazines, none of which were ex uh, accepted. I tried to get my wife to defect since I was appreciated in Russia, but she, we stayed here. Leningrad, 1941-42. Once there were many children who were cold, so cold 
At night, their thin arms clung tight around mothers who were cold, so cold, while terrible dreams were dreamed of food that was cold, so cold, so very cold. Many little sleds squeaked over snow that was quiet, so quiet, and no laughter was laughed by riders who were quiet, so quiet, while sliding, sliding toward a place that was quiet, so very quiet. O oh, children of Leningrad, beautiful Leningrad, who are old, so old, so very old, may your children be warm with laughter. Thank you. Linda Dunn. Um, I'm going to share three poems, short poems with you today from my chapbook, Shape and Shadow. And um, the first one um, came about because one night um, I was driving down the interstate and there was a super moon and I howled at it and made the mistake of telling one of my sister poets about that, and she said, write a poem. And so that's where this poem comes from. It's called Urge. Moon calls tides, my zodiac sign water. Moon calls me. Unlike the sea, I cannot flow outward physically. Moon stirs primal essence, concealed, not denied. It insists that I howl, sometimes in silence, but sometimes out loud. And um, the next one is, um, well, it seems to have, to have skipped away from me here. Um, oh, here we go. Um, this one is, is a metaphor poem. Um, you may be familiar with that, but it, it is, seems to be talking about one thing, and as you read through it, it's talking about something else. And it's called Repairs Needed. Another deluge envelops us, and the gutters still aren't fixed. The translucent veil descends, but cannot disguise the problem. No channel exists to control the flow. A rivulet circles our foundations deepens its path with each passing storm. Our choice, avoidance, not resolution, so the gutters don't get fixed. Perhaps the structure will wash away. And the third one is the, the last poem in the book, and um, it may be my favorite. Uh, as you know, our poems are like our children, and they're all equal, but some of them we do love a little more equally than others. <laughs> It's called Observations on an Autumn Evening. Low slanting sun gilds all it touches. Even old white horse, himself burnished, swishes a tail of floating gold strands, grazes on tawny summer grass remnants. Dried leaves float down, seeking their rest, and unburdened branches whose shapes are revealed in their true patterns against the pale sky. As day's last light blends to night's shadow, I am content. Seasons of life blend one to the other, reveal things more clearly in a softer light. And since I've got some time, I think, I'm gonna read one that suddenly occurs to me is probably appropriate since it's poetry day here in Williamson County. It's called A Poem Is. A poem is words I cannot say. Dreams destroyed, hopes retained, love confessed, emotion chained, fiery rage deep within, truth I fear to know, 
Tears behind the smile I wear. A poem is the face I would not show. Thank you. Next author poet uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Bell for Stephanie Renee Bell. She read last year too, and she has a wonderful book of poetry by, uh, of poems by her daughter, and she has put together, right? Yes. Yeah, and she has it over there. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm Dr. Denise Bell, and my daughter, Stephanie Bell, passed away at the age of 20 due to a brain tumor. And um, these poems are from her autobiography, and she also wrote four novels. The Thorn of a Rose, painted in poetry so that no one will know of the pain deep inside that just cannot be shown. For to know is to feel, to feel is to hurt, and no one else but the poet deserves to be dragged through this dirt. What is it like to be the thorn of a rose? What guilt must it feel when, to friends, it is a foe? All that it desires is to grow and to love, but its prick leaves a wound when others near for a hug. Though it means no harm, someone always pays. Thus, the thorn would rather push the ones it loves away. To spare them the worrying, anxiety, and tears, because living as a burden to others is the thorn's greatest fear. She wrote that during her illness. Some of the poems she wrote um, before her illness, such as this one, I believe. Um, I found these after she had passed. I didn't know she had written so much. And some are just um, dealing with just normal teenage angst. This is called Naked. They all want something from me, entertaining their perception of me. In private, they measure me. Their love is empty. It's about what they can take from me. Thus, their love is lust. There is no respect. I'm the vessel to their success. I'm the jewelry around their neck, tricked into giving my devotion and friendship. I'd take a bullet for them. They might stand and watch me die, thinking, there goes my success. Second guest, ridiculed, naked, stripped by their eyes, inhumane, cruel, and selfish. They watch me as I lie. The ground is cold like their hearts for me. I wish I could hide so they can't see me. So hurt I can barely rhyme. My gift is swallowed. Instead, I write until all the blood drains. My heart is stabbed, punctured by deception. I wish I hadn't trusted. I wish that I had questioned. I can feel for them, but they only pretend to feel for me. In order to steal my trust, my heart, to save it for a rainy day. They bring up the past, use it as bait. Remember when? They question me so that they can have their way. I only want to be cared about. I don't even need it indeed. Just promise me you feel for me, and off my friendship you will not feed. Love is sacrificial. It's not all about you. And this... Also, she wrote, I believe, before her illness. Abandoned. Am I unnecessary, the piece that doesn't fit? Everything I love is destined to hurt me. Everyone I trust will eventually desert me. Why am I writing poems that no ear will ever hear? Why do I possess this love for art that only burns and sears? They're falling off left and right from me. Their love continues to slow. The more my trust dissolves in them, I find I'm letting go. My skin is only so thick, I don't think I can take anymore. My heart is shattering day by day. 
but they only continue to ignore. What hurts the most is loyalty once displayed to my face, but now that they've left, I only see it as mere courtesy gone to waste. If you won't walk with me, then just leave me and don't make it worse. Don't play off how easily I get attached, my love that tastes like a curse. Don't ever give me another smile, then leave me all alone. Painfully, I beg of you to stop and to end this torturous song. <laughs>